Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Maskaram Gavragzaber, Assistant Clinical Professor and Director of Inclusion and Community Engagement in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. Um, I feel incredibly privileged to be able to provide timely and important programming such as today's lecture and want to thank all of you for joining us. Welcome to the fifth lecture of our new colloquium series titled Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis. This monthly series aims to highlight the work of contemporary scholars belonging to identities and traditions marginalized within mainstream Western academia, who through their work confront neocolonial power structures and challenge longstanding norms of knowledge production. It was born out of a demand from our graduate students for exposure to more critical scholarship that is relevant to their lived experiences and the times in which we are living. Specifically, I want to thank Nalubega Ross, Anais Rok, Tisa Lowen, and Aliyah Hoff, who worked with me to conceptualize this series and establish its parameters. I also want to acknowledge Shask leadership for supporting and sponsoring this series, specifically our unit director, Dr. Chris Stojanowski. Um, we actually have two talks scheduled for March because we were unable to present one in February due to some scheduling conflicts. So please keep an eye out for information on our uh, March 25th talk by Dr. Amanda Tashini. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of this talk. Um, before I uh, introduce our speaker today, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note that this presentation um, will, is being recorded um, while the Q&A session to follow will not. However, you, the audience, will not be visible in the recording and all of the mics will be turned off. As I mentioned, we will be leading, uh, leaving time for questions after the talk, and we're asking that you write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will be helping our guest speaker keep track of the questions and select which ones she will answer. If you would like to vocalize the question yourself rather than have me read it out, read it out please um, write ask live in parentheses at the end of the question you submit in the Q&A, and I will call on you and unmute your mic so you can do so. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rachel Watkins, currently an associate professor in the Anthropology Department of American University in Washington, DC. Dr. Watkins is a biocultural anthropologist with an emphasis on African-American biohistory and social history, bioanthropological research practices, and histories of US American biological anthropology. Initially, trained in skeletal biology, her work focused on looking at relationships between health, disease, and social location in people whose remains are in the W. Montague Cobb um, Anatomical Collection and interred at the New York African Burial Ground. Studies were carried out in the scholar activist tradition of deconstructing uh, racialized interpretations of human biology and the centering of black bodies in constructing racial categories and hierarchies. This research led Dr. Watkins to a broader interest in how African-American skeletal remains and living populations were centered in the de development of research practices and racial formation in US biological anthropology. Her current projects continue to draw on intellectual and political work tied to Cobb and his laboratory from 1932 to the present as sites for understanding science as a social practice. This includes traditions of black scholar activism, contesting scientific racism, um, our field's efforts towards critiquing scientific racism without attending to structural racism and the positionality of scientific researchers. Dr. Watkins is committed to, to using her research and expertise to engage in interdisciplinary and public discussions about race, health disparities, and science as social practice. This includes speaking to elementary, middle, and high school students as whether other as well as other public speaking engagements, such as today's lecture. She has also co-chaired the American Anthropo Anthropological Association's Anthropologists Go Back to School initiative with Dr. Camilla Hayward Rotini. Her talk today is titled, This System Was Not Made for You, Black Feminist Perspectives on Scientific Knowledge Production. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rachel J. Watkins. Hi, everybody. Thanks to everyone for being here. I'm looking forward to sharing this work with you, as well as some discussion, some Q&A afterward, hopefully. I'm assuming that the um, 
I can turn off the captions for PowerPoint, but it'll still be subtitled with the other function, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Great, great, great. So um, I always like to start with uh, my lineage and I've kind of expanded it based on some of the conversations that I've been a part of in, in conference sessions that I've been a part of and speaking to the importance of understanding this, this history and this, this intellectual lineage that I'm a part of. So I always start with this slide showing William Montague Cobb and his laboratory at Howard, who was the first African-American to receive a doctorate in biological anthropology in 1932. Um, after he received his training at Case Western Reserve, he came back to Howard and established a skeletal collection um, so that, as he put it, at the time, Negroes could participate in work that debunked this notion of biological <clears throat> race. In the scholar activist tradition, he did so by way of academic work, and he also published things um, for the popular press and his most notable paper, the one that's most widely known, Race and Runners, is one that he published in a journal outside of, of biological anthropology. And in fact, I have some interesting archival material that speaks to his difficulty getting that published in an anthropological venue. More broadly, Cobb's work is situated within an African descendant scholar activist tradition that is made up of people within and outside of anthropology. I always like to point out Caroline Bondé because even though Cobb was the first person to receive a doctorate, first black person to receive a doctorate, um, Caroline Bondé, I believe was actually the first person to receive a graduate degree. She worked with Ernest Hooten at Howard, I mean at Harvard and her research was important because it uh, looked at what is called in bioanthropology admixture. Her thesis was called um, Some Negro White Families in the United States. And one of the very important things that she pointed out was that this idea that people who had white admixture were kind of organically smarter and more successful and what have you was not the case at all, it was actually um, proportionate to the proximity that those folks had to their white relatives. So she you know, kind of helped to situate um, the advancement that was being attributed to white admixture to social mobility. And so you see Frederick Douglass, Du Bois, Cobb, Antonor Ferman, these are all folks um, who regardless of whether or not they were embedded within the discipline of anthropology were doing the work of taking on anthropological research that emphasized racial typologies. So this is a really interdisciplinary tradition and it's one that was also informed by their positionality. These are folks who were very clear that their knowledge and their understanding and their ability to critique this stuff came from both the uh, experience of inequality as well as studying it. And so the ways that they engaged in that work were, um, all, they engaged in all sorts of ways through art as well as their um, formal academic um, scholarship. Some of you might be aware that W.E.B. Du Bois wrote one of what we consider to be the first science fiction um, stories called The Comet. Um, you see pictures over there to the side of Cobb playing the violin. He would, lore has it that he would come into his anatomy classes playing the violin as part of his teaching of anatomy. And then the uh, image below that is Cobb playing W.E.B. Du Bois at the uh, Kennedy Center in 1982. And the reason why I like to emphasize this is because a lot of the work that we do, especially in anthropology and especially, especially in biological anthropology is often very much so focused on what we see on the bones, which is evidence of inequality and suffering. And so I wanna kind of resituate our gaze and our focus today to understand that yes, this is a battle that has been going on and continues to go on um, fighting against race and the outcomes of racism, but it also, or rather, and it involves a very 
intellectually, artistically sophisticated um, process. It takes a lot to be able to theorize yourself into humanity. I say to my students now, you know, it's very intellectually sophisticated and uh, creatively sophisticated process that is associated with having to do that. And if you don't have to do that, um, it's, it's not the, the same. So when we talk about diversity and inclusion and the importance of uh, bringing diverse perspectives into fields of study, it isn't just a matter of presence. Um, there really is a, a very particular and really valuable um, and really essential um, intellectual piece that we're bringing to the table. In terms of the continuance of the tradition that Cobb um, in the laboratory and the other ancestors I referenced are connected to, um, I have some pictures of the New York African Burial Ground research team and a conference that followed um, some years later. Um, a lot of my work focuses on William Montague Cobb and the laboratory he established and looking at the um, intellectual and political work that is either associated with the lab directly, um, associated with the lab or taking place within the lab and that is still um, happening. So this is kind of one of the aspects of the, the continuation. Um, I also wanted to highlight the folks who taught um, at Howard in the lab, specifically taught us, those of us who were there over the years in the lab um, specifically, because that's important um, as well. You see Michael Blakey there. He's probably the most well-known of all these folks as the scientific director of the New York African Burial Ground and he was at Howard for, for some time. And, uh, but I also want you to know about Shamarka Keda, who uh, following Cobb's tradition went to Williams and uh, has a, uh, an MD as well as a DPhil um, in biological anthropology. And so he was someone who was tied to the laboratory over the years. Leslie Rankin Hill, one of the few Black women in biological anthropology, um, who was based at University of Oklahoma, but was uh, very much so a part. She was the um, you know, co-laborer directly with Michael Blakey um, with the New York African Burial Ground Project. And then we have Mark Mack, who was the laboratory director during the New York African Burial Ground Project, who stayed on and was a professor of anthropology at Howard until his untimely death in 2012. The person in the center is Fatima Jackson, who's also probably well known to many of you. Um, I left her for last to highlight that she is now the current director of the Cobb Laboratory. And you know, all of these folks have various uh, backgrounds, but all do work uh, or did work that continues this tradition of um, addressing race, writing and researching against race, and also being engaged in, in public and applied work to that end. Some folks who are not often talked about are the folks who came after that, like me. So these are two people who are a part of my crew. Um, Teresa Leslie was actually a year ahead of me at Howard. She received her doctorate at UMass Amherst, which is very much so a part of the uh, tradition coming out of the Cobb Laboratory. Um, she, was a uh, she is a biological anthropologist and she's someone who is also an interdisciplinarian. She just wrote a book called Eight Years in Stasia um, talking about race and colonialism in St. Eustatia and how it continues to manifest. Joseph Jones is someone who was uh, came a few years after us. We were all working on the project together. Um, Joseph also received his doctorate at uh, UMass Amherst, and he did his dissertation work, I believe, on the um, a dental component. He did a, a, a lead study using the teeth from uh, people at the New York African Burial Ground. He's now at the College of William and Mary but again, carrying on that interdisciplinary tradition, he uh, worked on the race project 
And the picture that you see of Joe is um, a picture of him assisting with ushering some ancestral remains that were unearthed uh, at uh, near Virginia Commonwealth University, the remains of folks whose bodies were used for um, anatomical purposes. There was an entire uh, kind of, you know, ceremonial, you know, there a lot of public engagement, um, public direction, and a ceremony to um, rebury these folks and rebury them appropriately. So that's the picture you see here. And I think it's also important to highlight that Joe was, um, as a biological anthropologist, he was the person who actually was chairing the descendant community committee. So, you know, he wasn't, his primary role was not the skeletal biology. It was the engagement with the, uh, with the public and with the, the descendant community. And that's something that's important to highlight because the work that all of us do, even though we're embedded within or have our uh, roots in biological anthropology, um, the work that we do uh, most clearly reflects this broader scholar activist tradition. I have the next image that I added there is um, of me in various stages. And you also see various stages of the, uh, what I call the black girl hair life cycle, cornrows, Afro puffs, head wrap, what have you. And this is a slide that I share with a lot of the students that I uh, talk to in the K through 12 context to give them a little bit of background about how I came to study bones um, and, and do biological anthropology because folks think that's strange. And often it's the case people say, okay, if this is going to explain who you are, how how is that? Because it's pictures of me and then you see some really creepy dolls. Those are the kinds of dolls that we had at our disposal in the 1970s. They're called the Sunshine Family. And the reason why I have them on there is because I want to share a story about how I got into this. It actually is, uh, you know, I got I got into this maybe 40, 46 years ago. Um, my mother said that one day I was, you know, being whatever, unbearable when I was like five. <laughs> and so to get a break, she put me in the bathtub because I love bubble baths and she put me in there with the Sunshine family. And she, you know, went, took a beat. And she said that when she came back, there were Sunshine family heads and arms and legs and torsos floating all over the tub. And she was abhorred. And my mother, you know, she's she's very religious, my mother is. So this was really, really disturbing to her on many, many levels. And she said that she looked at me and said, Rachel, why did you do that to the Sunshine family? And she said that I looked up at her very earnestly and said, because I wanted to see what was on the inside. Um, and she shared this story with me, which of course I didn't remember when I went through the very natural process of saying, okay, I'm gonna quit my program. I'm leaving this doctoral program. So she shared this story with me and she said, look, you have been trying to explore what was on the inside since you were you know, four or five years old. So please get off the phone and go back um, to work. And, and so I did. I also like that story because while I initially started to look at what was on the inside by way of skeletal remains, there is this deeper interest that I came to have about what's inside the ways in which we do our science. What are the, the ways of knowing that we engage? And that's part of the inside too. And that's the work I do now. And that's what those images that you see here suggest. I will admit, Dear Science just came out. I haven't read a whole lot of it. I may be like 50 pages in, it's great, but I wanted to highlight it since it just came out. Um, the work that I'm bringing to the table, to this tradition has to do with bringing in black feminist critiques of science directly or indirect you know, critiques of science um, into biological anthropology. This is important because of the very small number of Black women who are in biological anthropology. There's not really a space to bring your whole self to the table if that is who you are and depending on how you um, identify. I also think this research is really important. The scholarship is really important in terms of helping us to move forward and how it is that we address 
structural racism along with the scientific racism piece, because that's something that we've struggled with for uh, quite a while. And this work uniquely kind of provides frameworks for uh, better addressing that, again, that come out of the lived experience of being racialized and gendered in particular ways that require you to theorize the craziness as well as theorize your freedom and your humanity um, amidst all of this. So um, that's what that work is. Sylvia Winter is uh, the person I'm gonna focus on for the most part today. Um, Hortense Spillers um, work is important because she has some scholarship that focuses on the distinction between um, the body and flesh. And she talks about flesh as being uh, treated as raw material. That's the the body without agency, um, and then the body uh, has agency. And she talks about the ways in which historically Black folks have been used as the raw material for various um, things. And what I bring to the table is I say, yeah, that includes scientific knowledge production. Um, Racecraft is uh, a, a fantastic book that also kind of speaks to uh, ways in which within the context of Western science, the biological and the cultural, the ideological and the material are brought together in ways that often kind of elude us when we're talking about this stuff at the same time that we're attempting to um, engage in some sort of research. So that's why I appreciate that. Dear Science is actually um, a collection of essays that speaks to, uh, that's inspired by the work of Sylvia Winter, but really focuses on this tradition of uh, what McKittrick calls Black creatives kind of engaging in science. So in totality, in totality, I kind of see this, this work and bringing this scholarship into bioanthropology and kind of utilizing it to look at our scientific practices as a way of reimagining humanity outside of the context of this biological race concept that's been uh, constructed and knowingly and unknowingly maintained even when we're attempting to deconstruct it. Um, also reimagining science, what it is that, that science is and what that means. Um, and then also reimagining scientific expertise. What does it mean to be a scientific um, expert, is that a matter of particular methods, how you employ the scientific me method, or is there something else to um, that? I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, a recent conversation that I was a part of having to do with uh, a scholar who is engaged in some archeological research that focuses on enslavement. And there were some questions raised during that conversation that led me to ask this question to myself. I didn't bring it up because I didn't want anything to, to pop off there, but it led me to ask myself, to what extent is someone whose research uh, specialty in archeology span or biological anthropology or bioarchaeology, you know, to what extent is, is that person whose work is focused on enslavement accountable intellectually for reading a book like Beloved? You know, how it, should that be? You know, to what extent should that be uh, an aspect of the intellectual robustness of studying enslavement? Um, many of us would argue, if you're gonna do that, you should indeed be accountable. So those are the kinds of, of questions that I think this, this scholarship allows one to raise. And that is not at all to poo-poo science uh, or the scientific method. This is a matter of kind of broadening our context and thinking um, more broadly about the, the questions that we ask as, as scientists and what is involved in scientific ways of knowing. So I have been using this work to kind of deconstruct the notion of academic production, right? Because this is this aspect of, of knowledge production 
is one that emphasizes a particular way of doing the work, a particular way of disseminating the work that uh, kind of leaves out a lot of the knowledge that people are perhaps bringing to the table. Also, you know, again, how it's disseminated and distributed. This work is also really useful in deconstructing disciplinary boundaries. And that's because going back to the slides I showed and what I mentioned about Sylvia Winter's work and Kath Catherine McKittrick's work uh, regarding Sylvia Winter, that interdisciplinarity is essential for deconstructing race and understanding race outside of having to utilize some sort of material, um, material anchor, because that's a huge part of the reason why I would argue we continue to struggle with getting rid of race. There's a way that even in our deconstructions of race, we center the body um, where it's almost like you're using the word to define something, you know, so it, it kind of reifies race at the same time that it's deconstructing it. So these interdisciplinary ways of looking at race and deconstructing race are very much so important because the folks, especially African descendant folks who are coming to the table deconstructing this stuff historically and in the present are drawing on various sources. Um, and so with that said, this is also about recognizing embodied and intellectual experience uh, as one in the same and as being uh, equally important in the intellectual endeavor. Um, and along with that, deconstructing that appropriate uh, academic and naming and theorizing. And this is why I actually titled the paper that this talk is based on, the system was not made for you. Because while that's uh, a statement that is considered to be rather colloquial, there's a whole lot of knowing in it. There's a whole lot of processing and theorizing that goes into saying the system was not made for you. And there's also the same sort of theorizing and, and, and genius and processing that's engaged in knowing what that means. So this is just a slide to kind of um, highlight the things that I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk, kind of looking at how this black feminist, uh, these black feminist critiques of science allow for looking at the boundaries between the scientific and the non-scientific and the biological and cultural in different ways, or rather deconstructing um, them. And this is just to uh, review racecraft, um, the, the parts of that work that I largely draw on have to do with how Karen Fields speaks to these invisible ontologies, how there is this way that the ideological is made material through props and how historically racialized subjects are utilized for those props. Sylvia Winter's work, which is what I said I was gonna center on, um, she has a concept that is called biocentricity that I think sums up very nicely the ways in which we continue to do some of our work, including our work toward deconstructing uh, race. Biocentricity is a term that she uses to um, sum up this kind of overrepresentation of a white cis het male um, ideal of, of humanity. And as part of that process, we're engaging in practices that marginalize other folks who don't fit that bill from humanity. Um, and again, kind of related to what Karen Fields speaks to, she's, she talks about making the sociogenic ontogenic flesh. So making that thing which is socially constructed seem natural. And she also emphasizes the importance of viewing human beings as simultaneously biological and cultural. And this is something that really resonated with me because of the training I received focused on this kind of biocultural interrelationship. The way that Winter talks about the simultaneity of being biocultural is very helpful in terms of destabilizing this kind of scientific, non-scientific boundary that we 
knowingly and unknowingly rely on when we are engaged in some sort of biocultural analysis. Um, in other words, the science comes first or the science is foregrounded in a way that kind of backgrounds the historical and the cultural. And her conceptualization of who we are scientifically involves leveling that out. And then of course, Hortense Spillers and her use of uh, this notion of flesh and it being this kind of raw material of scientific knowledge production. The other thing that is, is uh, emphasized really in the work of all three of these folks is that there is no such thing as a biological existence that precedes these identities, that precedes racialization. Um, and that is important, again, because there's a way in which in the context of a kind of Western scientific, non-scientific boundary, something like that is not going to be uh, recognized. So zeroing in on uh, Winter's work and this notion of, of uh, biocentricity and looking at human beings as being simultaneously biological and cultural for winter, this is about deconstructing that idealized notion of humanity to make way for very forms of, of human existence. And that involves interrupting, right? These disrupting and identifying these biocentric loops of knowledge production. And there, there's a great way, her essay, NHI, No Humans Involved, sums it up quite nicely, including how it is that she sees this process of academic knowledge production as being implicated in uh, supporting the racialization of people and in so doing uh, violence against racialized folks. So no humans involved is actually a police term that was coined in the mid 80s, uh, no humans involved is a term that is largely attributed to um, deaths and other crimes that happen that involve people who are not considered to be people, people who are not rendered human, people who struggle with addiction, sex workers, uh, Black folks. She actually wrote the essay after uh, the LA police officers um, who beat up Rodney King were acquitted. And she talked about how, you know, there's this way that people can, there are certain folks who consider, who continue to be marginalized from the centers of humanity such that violence against them is justified. And she, as part of that argument, talks about the ways that academics are so committed to this process of knowledge production and maintaining the space in which certain types of knowledge can be produced that their interest, right, even if we think our interests are, are rooted in some sort of, or some form of justice, it's really not, it's really more rooted in wanting to continue to be a part of and continue to reproduce this space in which you can be considered some sort of expert on a subject. And she argues toward the end of the essay that we need to, as she puts it, marry our lot to the causes of folks who are uh, undergoing all sorts of violence as a result of these conceptualizations. She goes even further, part of her proposal involves a new or a kind of recoded form of science that doesn't just rely on empirical evidence. She says, you know, there are all these ways in which the sociogenic is, is created as ontogenic or is made ontogenic, and we need to uh, adopt forms of science that allow us to address that, to identify that and address that. And the main piece to her notion of re recoded science has to do with the integration of narratives. She says that we need a science of the word and that the science of the word can assist with disrupting knowledge and the realities that are produced through this kind of Western scientific empirical um, evidence. And she says that the simultaneity, right, in this, the, the inclusion of narrative allows for us to get at these uniquely human domains of experience that, that Western science 
disregards, right? And it's drawn on, or she draws on um, Césaire and Fanon to kind of conceptualize this science of the word. And the method she uses is called languaging, right? So bringing kind of narrative, looking at narrative and creating narrative um, around these scientific practices. Um, and essentially that's what Catherine McKittrick, I think in large part is, is doing. She's languaging and she's looking at our, the tradition of languaging among um, African descendant scholars and creatives mostly. Um, so the reason why I think it's important to do this and I've attempted to bring this recoded form of science into bioanthropology is because narratives themselves, there are a lot of narratives that we as bioanthropologists focus on and there are narratives that we use to kind of, or that we draw on and that we kind of rely upon to explain our identity and to kind of sum up in various ways the work that we do. And that's especially the case around our kind of history and our traditions around deconstructing biological race. We, you know, talk about Boaz and, you know, there are, are very typical things that get evoked. And Cobb is actually a part of that as well, this kind of canonical narrative uh, tradition. And so what I wanted to do with this idea of the science of the word and languaging and looking at kind of the simultaneity of biology and culture is get at what, what narratives do, that narratives are actually a part of scientific knowledge production, that they are scientific knowledge. I wanted to situate them as such. And that's important to do, I think, because you know they're not just stories. Um, and especially it's the case that there are ways in which ideologies are embedded in narratives that have a lot to do with, again, why it is so difficult for us to, you know, kind of deconstruct these uh, ideas around race and really kind of do away with the race as well as the racism. So that's what led me to start looking at Cobb's manuscripts and his interactions with his colleagues and looking at the way that he's constructing and deconstructing race outside of just looking at his work. Um, going back to what I just said about how ideologies and things are embedded in these narratives, what you find are you know, all sorts of evidence of racial formation that again involves this kind of narrative formation of it. They are not just um, doing the scientific research as well as the precision. And it's also worth it to do in terms of the continuum because a lot of the logics of racial difference that were constructed by way of the handling of bodies are the same logics that show up in our understandings of um, human variation in racialized context when it comes to genetics and things. We uh, many, there are lots of science technology scholars, especially that talk about this genetic reconscription of race. And that has to do with the logics that um, were established previously sticking around. I didn't plan on showing you um, the video anyway, but um, what I have here and have shown in the past is a segment of a documentary called Race, the Power of an Illusion that focuses on Cobb and provides you with this very nice canonical telling of the race and runner story where, you know, Jesse Owens and the rest of the Ohio State and Olympic um, team members, you know, are headed to the Olympics. Um, it's 1936. Hitler expected that his people were going to demonstrate Aryan prowess and that did not happen. And so it was a moment the the Olympics was a moment where um, the ideas around racial differences in athletic ability were actually amplified in these really kind of crazy ways. Oh, you know, black people have an extra this and extra that, um, what have you. And so Cobb did uh, a study, he engaged in research on um, Jesse Owens. He kind of evaluated his musculoskeletal structure and found that his structure was actually more Caucasoid, named Caucasoid than uh, Negroid. And that was part of the way that he was debunking this idea of um, you know, racial difference in athletic ability. 
notice that he's using a body in a very particular way to deconstruct race. And there's a way that he's having to locate racial difference on the body to deconstruct racial difference. That's the sort of biocentric loop that Sylvia Winter is talking about. That is by no means to take away from the importance of the, the, the study, but it's very important to have a scientific way of knowing that recognizes that because that there's a part of that that perhaps unknowingly undermines being able to deconstruct um, race. I initially thought that I was gonna start this archival study kind of looking at Cobb's interaction with his colleagues um, because, well, that's what I assume, there's so much out there. And, and so, I started also with the race and sports stuff that I found in his manuscripts because I knew that was something that was most readily um, accessible to a wide audience if folks were pretty familiar with the work that, that he did around race and runners. What I actually found when I started doing that work and looking through the communication that he had with folks around race and uh, athletic ability were all these letters with this guy named Howard Duncan. I mean, and Howard Duncan is, and you can see those um, articles over there. Howard Duncan is um, a white guy who is an accountant. He has like no scientific training or anything. He, you know, somebody who, you know, pops up, writes a letter to T. Wingate Todd, Todd passes it on to Cobb. You know, oh, I want to do I want to do an article on race and athletic ability. I'm doing it from the popular point of view, but I still want to confer with um, some scientists. And so he proceeds to do that. He proceeds to get this kind of what you would consider to be really kind of odd, unique access to all of these scientists um, as he's kind of working out his beliefs about uh, race racial differences in athletic ability that certainly Cobb wouldn't be able to, to have. You know, he, you know, Cobb had to go through all sorts of schooling and, and whatnot to get access to these folks that, um, that Howard Duncan just kind of had ready access to. And so that led me to going back to um, the, the ideas that I was mentioning before, that, that led me to, you know, kind of zero in on the way in which the social relations that are actually a part of the story that are left out of the canonical telling, what those things tell us about how racialized power is enacted through science. So you have Howard Duncan, who has absolutely no training whatsoever, um, inserting himself in this discussion. And these letters are not to be believed. You should, you know, I'm sure you can imagine how he was talking to Cobb as an equal. Um, also, just this idea that Howard Duncan's interest would provide him with a venue for, um, for, for engaging in this work as a scientist to whatever extent he wanted to. And I say that because in one letter he wrote to Cobb, he says, where is it? Ah, here we go, that he had the opportunity to examine Jesse Owens. So just like Cobb examined Jesse Owens, he examined Jesse Owens on a train. Imagine being a 22 year old. Jesse Owens was 22 years old and in college at the time that this happened. Duncan happened to see him on a train and proceeded to engage in an examination and writes Cobb about it and says, well, here's, you know, here's what I found. And so I found that to be very telling in terms of the ways in which Cobb is situated in the kind of happenings around race and runners, how Owens is situated in this telling, as well as Duncan. Very, very different from that canonical, uh, that canonical telling. And so what that led me to argue is that that canonical telling is a part of a biocentric loop of knowledge production. What we need to be doing is languaging so that we can understand the ways in which, you know, and the various aspects of social relations that are taking place and the ways in which people 
our position. Cobb is not just the pioneer, the first to do, you know, whatever. He is a, a racialized subject and he's being racialized um, in various ways, but especially through Duncan and the way that Duncan um, deals with him. Um, the, the slide just has um, a, a point that I made earlier that there's a way in which the narrative as this kind of emblematic or kind of representative, you know, way kind of helps to extol the virtues of the work we're doing to debunk race. Um, how it is that it reinforces this idea that race is in the body and that focus has a lot to do with maintaining this separation between race and racism that's not there. Again, this is stuff that comes up for our ancestors, for Du Bois and everybody else repeatedly, that this, this, this notion that there's some separation between race and racism that allows you to do scientific research on one side and you know, kind of address the social ills on the other side um, is not at all appropriate. So, I have no problem admitting that the Howard Duncan stuff was extremely um, distracting, but in a good you know, intellectual way, but it was extremely distracting in that um, it kind of held back or kind of pushed back the time that I started to dig in to Cobb's interactions by way of correspondence with Melville Herskovitz, Ashley Montague, Wilton Krogman, et cetera. So I'm just getting to that. This is just an outline of some of the things that I am looking at in the broader project that uh, involves looking at the correspondence with all of these folks. These are the domains already done, the, um, the, the, the athletic ability piece, also lots of interesting correspondence related to this expertise that these folks are developing. And then we have the request from the general public to refute or deny racial assertions. And again, it was an interesting kind of surprise to find that my very first um, study involved kind of both number bullet one and bullet three. What I wanna kind of end with here then is to uh, kind of share a little bit of what is developing from my analysis of um, Cobb's interactions with Herskovitz and uh, Krogman. So, and, and the reason why this, this is important, again, for understanding Cobb in the context of American biological anthropology has to do with how important the cultural history is to understanding who Cobb is as a scientist. We were told, and we know that Cobb did not consider himself to be a Boazian. Cobb was a Howard professor, and he was very much so a part of this Howard circle that, uh, as Lee Baker calls it, was very much so a part of this kind of cultural legitimacy school. So there was not, uh, there was a de-emphasis, and actually these folks were kind of against the, the emphasis on African um, cultural continuities and they really were kind of emphasizing and very much so about promoting the cultural distinctiveness of American Negroes in terms of being worthy of being regarded as, you know, a, a, you know culturally fitting in, right? Culturally being um, for all intents and purposes, you know, this is how they were asserting the humanity of the American Negro. No, it is not, you know, rooted in Africa or in an African past. It's something that is rooted in the effort that we have put into becoming what we are today. And that's certainly a part of what Howard, right, is, is about um, and, and the whole kind of Howard project. So Cobb was a part of this Howard um, circle, and it's important to keep that in mind so that when we talk about his biocultural orientation, we're not just leaving it to Boaz, right? Within biological anthropology, Boaz is really all we have. You're kind of relegated to do that. So this work is going to kind of open up and help us to understand in a more complex way um, Cobb's bioculturalism. Um, while he was a part of the Howard Circle, so this is the other piece, it's not about a, a binary, um, speaking of those complexities, while Cobb, uh, Cobb was very much a part of the Howard Circle, he did indeed maintain a relationship with Herskovitz. 
and the uh, ACLS image that you see there that has to do with a hello interdisciplinary aspects of Negro problems um, conference that they were part of together in 1940s. Uh, also, just kind of highlighting how Cobb understands himself to be a racialized subject. He's very much so a part of the um, social and intellectual fabric in bioanthropology, but you see he understands how Black folks are being viewed, right? Nearly every distinguished living anthropologist, and I know them all now, has private reservations about the intellectual possibilities of the Negro. A final piece to um, this kind of figuring out who Cobb is, right, through this larger project that's going to go on, has to do with how, as a pioneer, who he is as a person, um, not just a racialized subject, but a person who is culturally situated, has really um, not been engaged at all. But what I want to highlight here is that Cobb was a member of the light skinned DC elite. He was a member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. He was a member of the Boule, which is the most exclusive African American fraternity and the oldest in the United States. So again, these are things that absolutely play a role in who he is in terms of his orientation as a bioculturalist, as well as a racialized subject. And that's stuff that is, is worth um, considering. Here's something else I wanted to, to highlight to kind of speak to his approach, his biocultural approach, and why it's important to not just situate him in a particular way within bioanthropology, but look at him as part of this larger African descendant um, scholar activist tradition. Among the many letters he writes to Krogman, he talks about this multilateral activity that he has going on, medical organization, medical or education, and he says, unorthodox perhaps, but vital. So he sees this as, as vital. So I will end, ah, 46 minutes. I will end just by saying that um, this is about, again, this is not about poo-pooing science, but this is about, um, if you will, providing us with more tools to kind of challenge ourselves to, understand and figure out what scientific expertise means. There's all this scholarship that is taking place right now, really robust, important scholarship that's happening where um, you know, my colleagues are talking about, for instance, how architects of, of skeletal collections uh, are shaping the identity of that collection. But in turn, they're also being, the, the scientists uh, themselves are being shaped by the, the collection. And if we're looking at those sorts of things in a historical context, it suggests that we should probably be uh, asking the same questions and looking at the same dynamics amongst ourselves. And I'll stop there. Thank you.